Well, welcome back. For those of you who missed my earlier remarks, I'm Victor Zhao, the president of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine. And I'm honored to be here again to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Nuba Afiyan. Nuba is a pioneer in the field of biotechnology and a recently elected fellow of the National Academy of Engineering, our sister organization. We're delighted to have him here today. So I want to pr provide you with some brief background on Dr. Afiyan now. It's going to take me a long time, so I'm going to try to condense this. He's the founder and CEO of Flagship Pioneering, and Flagship has fostered development of more than 100 scientific ventures, resulting in over 100 billion in aggregate value, thousands of patents and patent application, and more than 50 drugs in clinical development. During his career as an inventor, entrepreneur, and CEO, Nuba has co-founded and helped build over 70 life science and technology startups. He's the co-founder and chairman of the board of Moderna. You'll hear a little bit about this. As you know, it's a pioneering mRNA vaccine company that's addressed the global COVID-19 pandemic. Also, Omega Therapeutics, Generate Biomedicines, Tessera Therapeutics, Profound Therapeutics, Rubius Therapeutics, and others. So Nuba has written numerous scientific papers as a, and is a inventor of over 100 patents. He was a senior lecturer at MIT Sloan School of Management from 2000 to 2016 and lecturer at Harvard Business School until 2020. He teaches and speaks around the world on topics ranging from entrepreneurship, innovation, economic development, to biologic engineering new medicines and renewable energy. Really quite amazing, impressive. Now, Nuba was born in Beirut to Armenian parents in 1962. Did his undergraduate work at McGill University, like me, and completed his PhD in biomedical engineering at MIT in 1987. He's a passionate advocate of contribution of immigrants to economic and scientific progress. So Nuba has received the Golden Door Award in 2017 from the International Institute of New England in honor of his outstanding contribution to American society as a U.S. citizen of foreign birth. He's also awarded a Great Immigrant Honor from the Carnegie Corporation in 2016 and the Technology Pioneering Award from the Work and Reform 2012 and presented with the Ellis Island Medal of Honor in 2008. Very impressive credential. Well, you know, I'm an immigrant myself, and I have been in privilege in Nuba's company in several of these recognitions. First, being a McGill graduate, and like him, subsequent recipient of recipient of honorary degree. I also received the Golden Door Award of the International Institute of New England, and I also received the Ellis Island uh, Island Medal of Honor. But my recognition and accomplishment pales in comparison to the extent of Nuba's entrepreneurism economic impact. So today, Nuba will be discussing the concept of preemptive health. He's pioneering this whole field. You know, he'll tell you preemptive health is defined by its goal of protecting, maintaining, improving people's health prior to illness. I think that's what health longevity is all about. Starting with the premise, the health should be accessible for all. Preemptive health and medicine initiative reflection is pursuing interventions that protect health from external threats and those who can that can prevent or delay uh, the onset of diseases. I think this concept is consistent with our vision of healthy longevity. Nuba's work, in my opinion, has the potential to revolutionize the way we prepare for next infectious disease threats, and preempt and prevent other ill diseases. So um, I think the goal is to serve people before they become patients, adding years to life and life to their years. So with that introduction, I'm sorry, Nuba, I didn't do you justice of all the work you've done. Let me turn it to you, over to you, and for you to tell us more about your exciting work. Dr. Afiyan. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Victor. And uh, hopefully you can hear me. Otherwise, somebody will, will, will say something. So I'll go on. Um, first, you know, I, I'm <clears throat> happy to follow in your footsteps wherever you go, because that's uh, higher and higher in, in accomplishments. And I appreciate your flattering comments about things that I've accomplished. But, but I don't, I think the audience knows that that in no way minimizes uh, uh, what you've contributed, uh, which has been uh, uh, deeply appreciated by all of us. Um, what I thought I'd do in the time that I have given the heterogeneous audience is to talk about three things. I really uh, spend a, a chunk of time at the end about preemptive health and medicine and what it's about for us. But to get there, I want to share with you a little bit about what it is that we do as a company and how we think about innovation a little bit differently and then how that manifested in one out of these 100 companies uh, in the case of Moderna. And then finally, with lessons from that and other sources, talk about what could be forthcoming in the future. Um, I think if you're on this call, you already know this, but I think it's worth stating that, that there, we really are in the early innings of a biological century. It's just simply the case that what we witnessed in the last 30 years of the past century uh, which felt like a big revolution, uh, in hindsight, seemed to be foundation laying for what really is the, the, the contribution of that revolution to life in general, in any form, whether that's human life or, or planetary life. And, and there's so much more that is coming, just like when engineering kind of ushered in a lot of what led to the industrial revolution, and obviously the applications of physics and chemistry, which have created so much uh, impact, we're seeing biology for the first time enter that realm in our view. And as a result, and, and I'll just switch over to talk a little bit about what my company Flagship Pioneering does. Uh, basically, we are all about creating breakthrough platforms that can ensure a sustainable future for life. And that can be uh, ranging in applications from, from food insecurity to aging to cancer all the way to pathogenic infections, climate change, and, and as we'll talk more about preemption today. So it's a very broad canvas that we could apply these uh, advances to. In a nutshell, uh, Flagship is a company that's now in its 22nd year of existence. It's a company that at once conceives, creates resources and develops, uh, first in their category, biological platform companies, that primarily apply themselves to solving challenges in human health and sustainability. Uh, as was mentioned in Victor's introduction, that has led to well over 100 new ventures that have been created, of which, importantly, some 73 of them so far have been based on scientific breakthroughs and inventions made in our own labs within Flagship. Uh, many of these companies have gone on to, to enter into the public realm and, and have operated to some 30 of them as public companies. Uh, within Flagship today, there's some 100 uh, PhDs, MDs, engineers working on the, the very underlying innovations that lead to these companies. Uh, there's currently some 56 ongoing clinical trials of, of drugs and many other products that range outside of human health, including agriculture. And the capital that goes behind this has grown to be in excess of $5 billion. Uh, this is an activity that requires quite a bit of scientific, entrepreneurial, and financial capital, and we deploy all three of them uh, in a combination, in a unique combination, as opposed to these things coming together in the context of each individual company. So let me just say a little bit about how we view the world a little bit differently. On this slide, if you just direct your attention to the bottom left, uh, you'll see kind of a simplistic depiction of how we view innovation, and that is in the gray circle is where I would place in any given field, in any given time, uh, a circle that represents the current knowledge and the current set of solutions that exist. And of course, outside of that gray zone is the adjacencies that are likely going to be the future innovations that will expand the circle ever, ever wider. Uh, so, so with that in mind, if you then look at where do people deploy capital today, what you'll find is that a lot of the current incumbents will invest in making innovations both within the circle, because that, those are niche opportunities, product extensions, 
and outside that uh, that gray circle, those are the small gray dots representing a diversified set of innovation bets, if you want to call it that, that will give them opportunities to expand what they're able to uh, uh, offer. Now, the zone of adjacency is loosely defined. I'm not making a scientific argument here, but an intuitive one. The zone of adjacency is goes as far out from the current present reality as people are willing to assess the risk reward ratio of any given idea. You know, will experts in the field, will an NIH panel, grant panel, will the heads of R&D and pharma fund an idea? And at what point will they think it's too uh, 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 far out, too unproven, too unreasonable? And so you can imagine that there's a zone belong, beyond which people are just not going to go. And, and that's where much of the current risk capital goes. A lot of venture investment is occupying that space alongside some of the large companies. And of course, if you do come up with something there, it's very likely that a large company will want to own it and buy it. And that's the usual kind of cycle of the life of a startup company. Now, in our case, after giving you that long description, we set out to try to see if we could make innovations well outside the zone of adjacency. And we did that purposefully, not because we are, you know, risk takers, et cetera, but because we thought that that blue zone is, is adequately covered with current approaches and current capital. But that red, that, that those red dots that go beyond it really had no way of existing because nobody would give you money. Nobody would bet their careers on working out there. And so we thought, okay, is there a way to systematically occupy that zone? And on the right side of this slide, and, I'll, and I'm not going to go through it, are, 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 is the logic for why you may want to do that, but also is the overwhelming logic where people generally don't do that because it's just flat out harder because you have to face the harsh elements of being first to do something when the rest of the world thinks it's impossible. Now, how do we do that? It's one thing to say that in a kind of a, a, as, as a concept, another thing to how do we actually do that? And so we have, over the last 22 years, developed a pretty systematic, repeatable process by which we do it, which as a shock therapy for you listening to this presentation, might, might, might surprise you to hear me use the expression as the first step being basically leaps of faith. Um, if you consider faith to be belief without facts, then the only way you can think about something imaginary that could be possible, not yet proven, is not by applying science only, because science requires belief only based on facts, but some extension, some ability to leap beyond the boundaries of, of facts, current facts. And that's what you need to do. You need to imagine a set of possibilities so that you can begin to explore these spaces that are beyond adjacencies. Otherwise, you're very contained within the space of adjacencies where people are willing to believe that what you're doing is not a major leap and therefore worth funding. So leaps of faith. And we call these what-if hypotheses. These are this is how we start our process. So we do some 100 of these per year, projecting out to any which direction, any form of life, any uh, unmet problem, et cetera. So we, we canvas the range of possibilities pretty systematically. But it's not as though these kind of leaps of faith are going to land on a really good idea. And, and so what you need to do once you posit something, if it, if it, if it gets some interest, is to really do what we call emergent discovery, which is that you, the best way to locally search a far out place, we think, is the application of something that's akin to Darwinian evolution, which is locally to do variation, selection, and iteration on the original leap. Uh, because what you can't do is assume that your leap is so accurate that it's going to come up with something that's immediately actionable. So you need to allow for the possibility that you iterate on that original idea. And upon rounds and rounds of iteration, where the selection pressure comes from talking to lots of people, academics, industrial R&D, et cetera, people with and without expertise in that field, you end up iterating this idea until it, some derivative version emerges that you kind of can't find out why it's a bad idea because nobody can tell you it's a bad idea, except it's not proven yet. And then and only then do we try to take that derivative notion and come back to the present and say, how do you get there from here? And this is essentially a form of reverse planning. So rather than exploring adjacencies and incrementally expanding the range of possibility, hypothesis falsification, the way we do in science, 
we would argue that there's another way of innovating where you essentially don't limit yourself to the adjacencies, allow yourself to leap, optimize around where you land with that leap, and then work backwards. And that's basically how we have developed the underlying science for much of what we do. And this is the process, not to get you too much into the details that we follow. Essentially, we start by asking what if questions. We do a set of work that reduces it, what you're seeing on the left side here in the first phase through variation selection to a few hypotheses that we can't eliminate. We then work on reducing them to practice in labs. And if we fail to fail in reducing them to practice, we consider that the, the, the positive indication to move forward. We create the platform and then we create a company. And that's where this kind of journey begins to op look like other companies, except they're working on far out technologies as opposed to uh, 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 currently proven technologies. Using this methodology, we've built an ecosystem that is uh, portrayed here. Uh, these are the current companies. We've taken out all the ones that over the last uh, uh, 20 years, certainly the first decade, have, have had their lives and then have in one way or the other uh, either been sold or, or discontinued. So this is the current ecosystem. And essentially, just to say that they, th th there's a progression from the left to the right as companies mature, the very outside, if you will, cell surface receptors that you're seeing there are the public companies. And in aggregate, this is about seven or 8,000 people today uh, occupying some three plus million square feet of lab space, mostly in Cambridge and Boston. And it's all emanating from this particular way of innovating. Now, more important to you and more interesting to you might be what do these things do? Um, we didn't set out to, to go after these in clusters. These are clusters that we derived in hindsight because we found that a number of these projections end up enabling things that you could put into similar categories, albeit out there. Uh, so for example, in the nucleic acid therapeutic area, we have companies that not only have enabled the first mRNA to convert into therapeutics and vaccines, but also the first tRNA, the first gene writers, uh, the first epigenomic controllers, and even new forms of non-mRNA that can be translated. Uh, that's the nucleic acid side. We're working on a number of delivery systems that are well beyond the range of what people consider possible today. Same with cell therapies. There's a range of novel biologics that, that are being developed that, again, extend beyond the current antibody drug conjugates or the bispecifics. We're not going to have time to talk about that today. There's a vast amount of machine learning integration to biology that we started working on some four years ago that have led to the, the conception of the very first uh, ab initio protein design effort that we know of, Generate Biomedicines, that's been doing this for the last four years, uh, cell-based modeling capability using AI that allows us to target cell state changes on and on. Again, forgive me for not going into much of these. And in the bottom right shows that uh, an interesting big category is what we call big biology. This is major extensions of what has been possible before, often using new techniques and new measurements that open up big chunks, if you will, continents of information about biology that we just were not at all aware of. For example, somatic variation, for example, the dark, what's being called the dark proteome. These are areas that we have been working on for multiple years uh, using this approach. So let me then uh, uh, switch over to talk a little bit about this in practice. And, and probably the most visible example of this is Moderna. Moderna started life as LS18, we tend to number, well, all of our companies are numbered in the beginning. Turns out it's easier to discontinue a number than a name. So we don't fall in love with the fancy name of a company very early on. And it all started with asking what if questions, like what if a patient could make their own biotherapeutic? What if it wasn't incorporated into the hardware, if you will, of the cell, namely the genome, but it could be done in a transient way? And, and what if all of that could allow us to dramatically change the cycle time of how quickly you could get a drug or a vaccine into trials. And all of that were interesting kind of what if questions that led us to do the work it took to actually begin to focus on using mRNA to answer these what if questions. Um, some 12 years later, where Moderna is today is it's got 47 programs in, in, in development as, as individual drugs and vaccines and 32 of them have already entered human clinical trials, uh, of which in one case, there's been quite a bit covered because of the COVID-19 situation. But if you step back a second, 
Obviously, Moderna is based on thinking about the central dogma of biology a little bit differently. And that is, rather than using proteins on the right side or DNA on the left side as the carrier of the instruction, what about using mRNA as, if you will, the software in between the ultimate program versus the underlying code, source code. And that, that conception, which was embodied here in a slide that's at least eight years old, uh, is essentially the idea was to say, if we could just get mRNA in in a way that can escape uh, um, the endosome, could we actually use the operating system inside a cell to make basically any protein we want and direct it everywhere that the cell knows how to do? And, and that, that was the kind of early conception. And in fact, in a, in, in a span of nine years, uh, we, we, we invested some $2 billion collectively with a number of pharmaceutical partners uh, uh, as well as private investors. And we went from an early set of inventions back in 2010-11 to a platform in 2012-13 that led to the attraction of several large pharma companies to work with us on these things, to partnerships with BARDA that led us to begin to look at infectious diseases in a more systematic way, then the NIH, uh, where we started working specifically on MERS with the NIAID, team led by the Dr. Fauci that much has been covered on, all the way to a number of vaccines. And by 2019, we had tried nine human vaccines and human trials and phase one trials already, going back to 2015, the very first influenza trial that we did. And, and that's when, of course, uh, 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 the world changed. And I'm going to cover that in a very brief slide next. But before I get to that, I want to just emphasize that it's one thing to do biology observationally or, 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 or iteratively, it's another thing to build a platform. And what we had done here was to basically build a platform whereby we could essentially take an amino acid sequence that we wanted to get expressed in a, in a patient's own or subject's own body, render it into an mRNA sequence, optimize it, manufacture it in a highly automated way. That goes from the plasmid all the way to the purified mRNA in a formulation with LMP and do all of that in a span where you can basically go from concept to being able to try it, if you need to, in humans, in, in less than two months, and if need be, in animals much sooner than that. And that capability existed even before we were confronted by COVID, which on this slide, I lay out the time frame of what actually happened between January 11 and 13 is what it took to go from the underlying RNA sequence of the virus that was uh, 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 made, a, made available to the mRNA-1273 that is in people's arms today. Uh, we did no further work on that. We had all the underlying optimization ready to go at the time. The first patient that was, or, or subject that was dosed in, in 44 days and so on. And I, I'm saying this not out of a pride, although the, the team who worked on this, and Moderna certainly uh, did some quite pioneering work in practice, not, not just in the lab, but the impact on, on human lives was, was an opportunity for this kind of a platform to really make a mark. And as you know, very recently, that's been now extended to a second uh, a family of, of vaccine, now, now a bivalent one, and so on. And, and we have reached over a billion uh, subjects with, these, uh, uh, with this mRNA platform. So far, our colleagues at Pfizer-BioNTech uh, have, have added uh, even more to that as they've entered into this space as well. And together, we think that, that the mRNA has certainly had a, a significant impact on protecting, important word, as Victor mentioned, protecting human health uh, uh, through the immune system. So what, what can we say about that? Why, why can you do this that quickly? And what does that tell us? Well, I'm not going to have time to go through this in the interest of time, just to say that a lot of conditions were there. Nine years of platform development preceded all this. Nine out of nine of the vaccines we had tried earlier showed neutralizing antibodies in human trials. So even while the world was not aware that you could convert mRNA code into proteins in humans, we were, and, and the neutralizing antibodies that would follow, we certainly were aware at the level of phase one trials. Uh, the work we had done in MERS scaled very nicely over to, to uh, uh, the SARS-CoV-2. Manufacturing, interestingly, the beginnings of manufacturing were in place because we were also using the same approach for personalized cancer vaccines, where it turns out that the cycle time to go from sequence information to a patient's own vaccine is very, very short. And that shortness scaled very quickly into going after a virus. Uh, otherwise, we would have been more than comfortable waiting a year or two to come up with a new vaccine, which is what this industry 
typically does, even just to test it. Forget about how quickly you can uh, 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 kind of design it and so on. So, so these are things, but importantly, this was a proof point that this can be done. And I think that should impact how we think about going forward in longevity, in other aspects of health, because you know I've been in this in this space for 35 years, and there really is to be in this space, you have to be incredibly patient and recognize that 10 years is a really short time frame. Not a very encouraging thing to say to this audience of innovators who want to see things happen and impact humans quickly. In our field, it just almost never happens. Uh, let alone the, the low probability of success, just things are supposed to take a long time, and therefore they do take a long time. This last uh, uh, two years have shown us that it doesn't have to be so, and you don't have to cut corners to do that because you can do thorough, very large trials if the impetus is there and the, and the, and the participants are brought together, whether it's through the government, pub, private sector, public health, et cetera. So with that, let me just kind of skip ahead and tell you a little bit about the, the main part on preemptive health and medicine so I can leave time for questions. So, you know, we've, we've, we've witnessed a fast pandemic, and I say that in contrast with slow pandemics because slow pandemics equally affecting the world, equally taking lives at massive, massive scales are with us and we live with them as though they're normal, uh, whether that's obesity or diabetes or cancer and many other chronic diseases. These are every bit as much pandemics as the infection-induced pandemics that, that we fear. Uh, and in fact, in this instance, the slow pandemics were the necessary substrates for the severe cases of the fast pandemic. So the two worlds kind of even, even uh, uh, collided um, uh, in, in, in our experience. Let me just make sure I don't lose power here. I apologize. Um, all right. So, um, so let, me, let me skip ahead. So what, what, do I, what do I mean by preemption then? Uh, this is kind of our next kind of a foray into the space. I, I would contend, again, sorry for the Zoom format, we don't really know each other, so I'm gonna say things that seem uh, assertive and I don't mean it to be that way, I just think of this <clears throat> as a hypothesis. But I, I, would, I would propose to you that our, our current health system is quite unhealthy in the sense that our society is considering healthcare to be essentially just sick care. 98% uh, of the capital that goes into the current what's called healthcare actually requires a prerequisite of sickness. Only 2% in different countries, it's a little bit more, uh, goes to anything upstream of disease. We don't really talk much about protecting health and we take for granted the status quo as it relates to the time and the cost and the process. And therefore, you know, we get what we have agreed to get, which is basically an extremely expensive and for half diseases that we confront, not not many solutions, forget about cures. And against that backdrop, you also have as individuals, I would say, and I'll be the first to admit I'm this way, we obsess over our physical security. We're willing to give up our privacy in order to go through any number of screens and, and to protect us against terrorism and against different physical assaults. But when it comes to our health, we don't really demand any security. We accept the fact that we're going to get sick. We're going to likely expire as a result. And therefore, there is a general level of, I'd say, differentiation between physical and, and health security. And I'd like to argue that the two of those, how we individually think and how society thinks, creates a, 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 a rather large problem, but also a large opportunity. And so we were, we were moved some three, three and a half years ago with this general notion of adding life to years not just obsessing over adding years to life, but the combination of the two, think of this as health span as opposed to just extending lifespan. And that is, a, is an interesting thing to say, okay, well, what's new in that space? And of course, what's new in that space is the tens of billions of dollars of R&D that's gone into the science of human health, very little of which has been used upstream of sickness, I would argue. And being one of the, one of the folks that develop a lot of weapons when it comes to the medical side, we hardly ever get, get work on the upstream. And, and this is something that's caused us to, to really become quite interested in this, in this space. So imagine if you started asking yourself questions about what if individual societies demanded health security and resiliency? Uh, what if there were products and services that were directly aimed at delaying or derailing disease as opposed to simply treating and trying to cure it? 
And what if we went from a sick care mindset, which really, really is kind of effective today because it exists, but ineffective to be able to reach the total demand we have for solutions to beginning to think about getting us uh, upstream, as, as I mentioned earlier. And in our language, we think about preemption more so than prevention, because we think prevention is a little bit like promising cures. You're likely going to disappoint people. And so if you promise prevention, uh, even as we've seen in COVID-19, prevention of infection is a very different thing than preventing serious disease and hospitalization and death. So prevention is, a, is something we can debate. Preemption, for which we by that we mean literally, as I said, delaying and, and changing the form and, and kind of moving the disease out of the track it's on, is, is, a, is we think a more achievable thing. Think of colonoscopies and, and the removal of polyps as a very uh, a good example of that, and there are many others. Imagine if that was available for Parkinson's and for diabetes and for many, many other conditions. We've differentiated between preemptive health and medicine by thinking about preemptive health as things you do not with drugs, not with medicines, and that which you do very early in disease, even earlier than disease with medicines, things that are categorized as medicines, and by that I mean NCEs, new proteins, uh, both of them should be deployed against this problem. The one difference is that if you're using natural biochemicals or other forms of intervention like digital health tools, you should be able to do it in a slightly different regulatory realm than if you're dealing with completely foreign entities that you use to do this task. And let me just kind of wrap up on this to say it's early in our development in this area, but we have a number of projects from the top left. We're working on a new way of thinking about even vaccines, thinking about using all the learnings we've made in COVID to see where a virus can go evolutionarily and casting a wider net to protect, as if you will, a shield against any particular virus and all of its natural kind of proximal uh, evolutionary adjacencies. We think there's ways to uh, select better antibodies in this approach, as well as base better antigens to vaccinate with. So that's one, immunogens. A second is to use the, the vast compendium of biochemicals that exist in our, in our food and that have been precedented, uh, all the drugs that have been tried and, 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 and previously entered humans. Look at that as a starting substrate and can we apply uh, machine learning AI and we're doing that to apply those to go at, get upstream of disease. That's what Monta is doing. There's a number of early detection approaches and then digital health platforms. So I just wanna lay that out as kind of something forward looking. And with that, I'll, I'll uh, take down my screen and see if there's a, a discussion that we can have. Well, first of all, I'm going to give you a great applause. I'm sure everybody else will too, even though they're doing it virtually. It's a wonderful talk, Nuba. And both in terms of laying out, uh, I think your, your discussion of reflection is spot on for this conference and many of our innovators because they also know how their ideas can result in something that would be eventually uh, have great impact. And I think you've, in a way, kind of defined some of those processes. It's great. And I think the issue of preemptive health and medicine also fits beautifully in our conference because that's what they all do. If you look at the range of the innovators and what they awarded for, indeed they're working on biologics, AI, machine learning, engineering. But I want to point out one other thing, and nutrition, by the way. And so you hear some people using AI looking at algorithms for prediction of uh, Alzheimer's, using imaging to look at prediction of disease. And so really in many ways they go upstream, as you're saying as to achieve health longevity. One thing you haven't talked much about is the social economic aspect. You did touch on it earlier, but we have social scientists who also work in this field because we believe that social well-being are also important for health and overall well-being of the individual. Do you have any thoughts about that aspect of uh, the work and how flagship or yourself in preemptive health is looking at it? Uh, sure. So look, there's there's a couple of ways to think about it. One is 
there's of course the whole public health angle where it is essentially the, the socialized medicine component of medicine everywhere in that it's something that governments are largely kind of taking on the, the, the our responsibility of providing to their population. And, and so there, I think the social context is worked in. Uh, obviously there, there is complete inequality issues, inequality of access, the lack of infrastructure to deliver the health to where it's needed. So if you don't have the basic healthcare infrastructure, it's really hard to, to, to get new solutions out there. Um, I think in the COVID-19 case, there was a significant amount of confusion around whether there was a supply issue or whether there was a ability to deliver to people who needed it issue. And in the fullness of time, within months, it became clear that the supply went from you know, very little to billions of doses and extremely little of that ended up in humans. So we need to address that at a global level. But then in terms of thinking about kind of preemptive health, as these solutions become available, who's going to pay for it? Who's going to get access to it? Is it only the rich who are going to get access to it or the insured? How to think about the social contract between the governed and the government as it relates to a right to health security? And I think these are things that you know, generally, especially in this country, Victor, as you know well, it's a very difficult discussion to have because there's a, there's a status quo with the insurance system that exists and all the intermediaries that almost makes it hopeless. And so every year we kind of roll our eyes when we see 17% of GDP, 20% of GDP, 23%. And at some point you think, okay, at 100%, we'll probably do something. I'm only just joking. But, but it is something that is kind of going to have to be uh, handled in a, in, in, in a bit of a different way. And so how do we get people to take more seriously responsibility over their own health upstream of disease? I think, again, I, I would love, and I don't know how to do it, but I, I really look forward to interacting with the National Academy in some ways, and even this initiative you have. I'd love it if people started realizing that by the time you have a disease, it's largely too late. And that the notion that there's not much to do about it before you have a disease, which is the way we live our lives today, is just knowably wrong. It's just wrong. And so this fear that people won't be able to handle it, if you make them afraid that they're going to get a disease, then you know, they're going to live their life differently. I, why don't we have that same concern about physical security? Why, why would we just say, you know what, let's go out and somebody yeah. attacks us or whatever. And then once you get hurt, then we'll deal with your physical security. We don't do that, and people can keep that straight. So I, I, have, I have optimism, but I don't have solutions. But it is a huge societal shift. And, and look, my view is that with some 20 million, now 22 million that's being thrown out of excess deaths during the COVID time, which cannot be explained other than by COVID, with 22 million people losing their lives and tens of millions with long COVID, the notion that we would not now have the will to deal with this is is terrible in my view. So I'm hopeful people will come together. I know that governments want to forget this and society as quickly as possible. But if what came out of this is a revisitation of what's the right social contract, it would be terrific. Boy, you have raised some really important issues. And like you, I start off as a, in this case, physician, scientist, uh, did some entrepreneurism, I'm involved with this. Now my biggest preoccupation are those issues. Because I think I know that you can deliver the technology, people like yourself, the platforms that can make a difference. The real issue for me, therefore, is how do you make policy changes? And I hope you and I can spend more time with your great influence to start thinking along this way. Because to realize the preemptive health vision, you're going to have to change policy. So let me begin by first saying, let's face it, social determinants. All those things are predisposing people to more disease. And if you want to go upstream, you've got to address the socioeconomic policy issues to begin with. Second, as you said, is equity, a big issue. Now, we're lucky during COVID that government's willing to pay for it. Had this been part of insurance, whatever, I think it'll be a lot more difficult issue to discuss. And so I know you care a lot about this. And so this is something we need to figure out how to do this, right? How to make sure people have access and distribution, et cetera. And so, the, I mean, you raised some really important issues. So um, 
I think in thinking about uh, for these young entrepreneurs who are all listening to you today, they want to know how to get started. You know, let's say that they, if you look at some of the, I mean, the session before was them describing what they're doing and they say, okay, you know, NAM, you gave us 50,000. That's not enough to get going anywhere, right? So how do we get to the next level? You may have heard that we do have the next level called Accelerator Awards, where through J&J, &J, Labs, and European Investment Bank and others, we give them the next set of dollars to help them keep moving forward. But I think that with your experience, and whether you knew, but you can talk a little bit about how to encourage them to say, listen, now that you're here, here's where you should be thinking about going. Um, so look, I think, I think that uh, depending on whether an idea is uh, uh, quite close to prior ideas or a little bit further out, I would think differently about it. If it's quite close to further uh, the, to, to prior ideas, you may be able to find an existing incumbent, a J and J, a Roche, a what have you, to actually embrace it and work with you under the right arrangements so that the technology advances, the approach advances. Um, it's not easy to do these kinds of partnering license arrangements, but there, all these companies are looking for that. The further out you get from what is currently imagined, the harder it is for them to assess whether it's a good idea or not. And so that skepticism keeps people from making those types of arrangements. And so you have to look at advancing the technology further through raising capital. And that capital today is vastly more available than it was you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, and, and, and so that's the good news. The bad news is the number of ideas that are competing for it have also increased mm -hmm. dramatically. And so you have to really learn how to both articulate the idea in what it could be, could become, the reasons to believe that the right set of things can <clears throat> kind of uh, 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 logically exclude it from being possible or, or prove that it can be done. So you, you'd rather fail early in this space. One of the most counterintuitive things to an entrepreneur is to prioritize experiments that might kill it early on. There's almost a survivalistic gene that makes us subconsciously delay doing the, the quote killer experiment because the alternative is that the idea is dead. But what you don't realize is that that's not the last idea you're going to have. And the sooner you can objectively disprove the idea, the, the sooner you get on to a better idea. That's something really, really difficult to, for people to internalize. Uh, and, but I would ar urge folks to, to, to consider that. And then really kind of network into lots of accelerators and incubators and the like that exist out there that take other people's ideas and, and advance them. Ultimately, there's large pools of capital and venture capital and, and, and other sources. So I think there's a, there's, there's a road ahead. And, you know, people might, a lot of scientists, maybe I'll say it this way, uh, and, 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 and people trained in medicine, think that they somehow do science and that other people have to do that. But I would say that the amount of learning by experience <clears throat> one needs to do in order to make a real difference uh, isn't so much that you should be turned off by that and say, well, I don't do that. I just do the science. Somebody else has to come along. Because if that's mm -hmm. somebody else doesn't quite understand the science, they're not going to persist long enough because they're not going to believe that it's going to work. At the first sign of trouble, they're going to basically bail out. So often, if you have the idea, uh, finding a team and finding like-minded people, the hard work, you know, I call this, it's another form of immigration, Victor, as you and I have gone through the journey of being immigrants, immigration physically to a new country and the fact that it makes you super kind of uncomfortable and unwelcomed often and just having to adapt to make it happen. You know, innovation is just intellectual immigration mm. and you have to be willing to immigrate and you have to be out of your comfort zone. You don't go to the conferences where everybody knows you. You go to conferences that nobody knows you and people make mm -hmm. fun of your ideas. It's kind of how yeah, an immigrant yeah. usually feels. So I'd say that's the journey ahead for an entrepreneur. Well, I tell you, I think a lot of people are nodding their heads, agreeing with you. You know, many new ideas, bold ideas. You know, I used to tell my lab, if your idea is not good, nobody's going to care. If your idea is good, there's going to be a lot of criticism and skepticism. 
and you're going to have to prove it, right? I, th I think your journey is just so amazing. Uh, I'm told that time is up. There are lots of questions, but I think I've represented them well. And Nuba, thank you so much. Thank you. And I promise we're going to get together soon. Okay. okay. Good luck to everybody. Thank you, everyone. Let Bye. me turn it back over to the meeting. Thank you. Thank you.